So it's so nice to be here. Um, uh, at the uh, risk of being seeming too formal, I think I'm going to stay back here so that the people on Zoom can can see me too. Um, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk with you about the research, recent research that's been done on jumping worms. Thanks to Carol and Janet and everybody here at HGCNY for for the invitation. I will say that the wild ones, as a as a national organization and the various chapters, frequently come up in discussions that um, jumping worm researchers and I have about. Um, stakeholders, people that are interested in this issue, because you all and um, because you all garden a little differently than other groups and have uh, different interests, it's it's uh, kind of like another angle on the gardening stakeholder group that that frequently comes up along with the master gardeners and uh, and others. Um, so I had intended this morning to grab some jumping worms out of my garden because I have them and uh, like so many people and, and bring them here for show and tell. I'd forgotten that, but luckily or unluckily for the library, there, there are lots of jumping worms in the gardens outside <laughs> here. And so um, we rooted around a little bit before. And so we've got a couple jumping worms in a a donut container here that I'll pass around if you're if you're interested to take a peek. Uh, you don't need to dig in there because you can see them through the through the container. Um, but those are like the stars of the show today. I'll be talking mostly about jumping worms, obviously, um, because there's so much interest to people right now. But I'm going to start off off by um, giving a little broader context to this group, which reminds me that I had spoken to this group, you know, I guess it was about four about four years ago or four or five years ago or so, um, about earthworms generally. And at that time, jumping worms were a relatively small part of the story because they had not gotten all of the attention that they've gotten recently. And they've not, they had not at that time demonstrated that they're going to be uh, as large a problem as it seems like they will be to forests of the Northeast and and elsewhere, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so there's been a pandemic between that presentation and this one, and it's so nice to um, be able to do this sort of thing uh, in person. So let me just jump in here. There we go. So just to uh, provide a little bit broader context, because clearly all earthworms are not the same, right? Uh, you know, these jumping worms are much reviled, right? right now, but those are, are just a few species of many species that are found here in New York State and in North America generally. Um, there are, you probably are familiar with other kinds of worms that you may not hate or that you may even like, uh, uh, night crawlers and things. Um, and so in New York State, there are about 30 species of earthworms. Of those, there are five species that we believe are native to North America. Those are none of those species are ones that you are likely to see in your garden or in your yard. Um, and I'm not going to talk any more about, about those. Hide this thing again. Oh well, you can see the important stuff. Um, I'm not going to talk about native worms um, anymore, although I'm happy after uh, afterwards to answer questions if you have about them. They're really interesting species, the native earthworms of, of New York. But again, they're, they tend to be found in more wild habitats. So I don't know, they may be in some of your gardens, but uh, they're not in the typical garden for sure. Um, of the, rema the remaining species then are all believed to be exotic to North America. The majority of those species from Europe that we probably received hundreds of years ago in transatlantic ships during the days when they used to use solid soil ballast in those ships. So things like night crawlers and earthworm, um, red worms, as well as the common composting worm, Mycenae fatida red rig wrigglers, if you, you know, purchase those and use them in composting, um, along with a lot of other species that don't really have well, um, familiar common names, but you probably would recognize them as something you've seen before. For example, in the early spring, oftentimes with, with the first heavy rains, there are a lot of these little uh, grayish kind of pink nosed worms that come out onto the sidewalk. Those, those also are from 
Europe. That's a genus called Aparectodia. So anyway, there are many species of earthworms from Europe that are found commonly in New York State. And then the last of the constituent, constituent groups of earthworms in New York State are these the, the, these uh, jumping worms. So they're actually, the group is bigger than just the things that we call jumping worms. And one of the first things I'll do here is kind of define what we mean by jumping worms. But the, the blue part of that pie actually is referring to worms of Asian provenance that have come to us from Asia. And there are in New York State eight of those species, but four of them are really uncommon things, um, and, and there are four that are more common, I'll talk about those uh, more today. They're all members of a family called the Megascalesidae, which there's not a test later, so, but um, just a, that's, that's a family of earthworms that in the Northeast, they're the only representatives of that family. Farther south, there are some native kinds of earthworms in that family, so these jumping worms are not as weird or whatever, you know, like compared to the other earthworms in the, in the south as they are up here where they're very different from everything else that we that we have. So that's just kind of the, the landscape. Um, regarding jumping worms, this is kind of an outline of what I'll talk about uh, today. And it's going to be um, partly an overview and partly an update. So those of you that um, don't know anything about jumping worms, I hope this will serve to kind of bring, bring you up to speed on the, the situation regarding these invasive species. But those of you that have worried a lot about jumping worms, hopefully there'll be some new bits in here that you haven't seen before. Um, so that's, that's my aim with that. So let me start out by talking about just what we mean by jumping worms and then talk about some of the relevant aspects of their biology, their distribution and how they're spreading here in the Northeast, their negative effects, our growing understanding of their, their negative effects. And finally, our growing understanding of what can be done to make life a little harder for them, uh, control measures. So these are the eight species of um, Asian megascalesid worms that are found in New York State. And like I said, four species, the ones that all are crossed out there, are, are ones that are only known from one or two sites, maybe botanical gardens or greenhouses. Not, they're not widespread in New York. The other four species are pretty widespread in New York. And three of those we refer to as jumping worms, the Amenthus agrestis, uh, Amenthus tokyoensis, and Metaphyre hilgendorfi. Again, no quiz. Um, and there are actually some now uh, decided upon common names of these jumping worms. They're like the giant jumping worm is Metaphyre hilgendorfi, and I can't even remember the other ones because they're not that frequently used yet. But anyway, everybody just calls these jumping worms. And as I'll talk about more later, we're not really not sure how these things affect the world differently. So it may not matter whether you have just one of these species in your garden or whether you have all three, or maybe it does matter where that's something that's being studied right now, you know, like the, how different are the three different species of jumping worms. There's one species up here that is definitely not a jumping worm. It does not jump, uh, but it's in this group. It's called a Minthus hupaensis. It's named for the province of China where it comes from. And that I just wanted to mention because you may see this thing, it, uh, but again, it's kind of like different from the other ones, and we're not sure that it's going to be a problem here in the Northeast. It's called the green stink worm. That's just an excellent common name. And like I said, it does not jump. If you find this thing in your gardens or wherever, like out on the sidewalk, and you pick it up, they will coil themselves into a big knot. They, they, don't, they don't move the same way that the other um, uh, Megascalested worms in New York State do, and it's called the green stink worm because they their salomic the fluid inside their body has a secondary compound that makes them smell really weird. I wouldn't say bad. I I, uh, I kind of in a way I always take a it's not like completely repulsive, but it's uh, clearly it's stinky to things that try to eat them because we believe it's a defensive kind of. And it smells unlike anything you will have smelled. So if you see one of these things, look for the knot. They're green. They are like really green to greenish black. And, you know, take a little sniff out of curiosity. It's not, nothing's going to be harmful uh, in that. That's all I'm going to talk about in this few But again, if you, if you have questions, I can answer them later. This is um, 
demonstrated itself to be a problem in a couple places, like in the Philadelphia and New Jersey area, they can be really pretty abundant. And in some places in the Midwest, they can attain really high abundances. And I think that the people in those places consider them a problem here and there anyway. In New York, everywhere that I know that they live, they just like every year they're about the same level of abundance and they they don't do some of the same things that the jumping worms do. So I don't think they're as big a problem. But again, we can talk about that more. Yeah. Which I of jumping worms together in a bucket, yep. all not together in one big bucket. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yes. No, I know what you're talking about there. Yeah, mm -hmm. nodding is is a common sort of thing in, in earthworms generally, but these things, it's their go-to. Like if you find one by itself and you touch it, it'll tie itself into a knot, like a ball. Um, whereas the jumping worms will not do that when you find them individually. They tend to do some other things that I'll talk about. Yeah, and that reminds me, just uh, in, an invitation, anywhere along the way, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them along the way. All right, so these are the three that we worry about, the, the three species that we refer to as jumping worms, like the Thetamicus agrestis, Hophioensis, and Metaphyra hildendorfi. They, um, they look pretty similar to one another. They all have, if you know, if you've ever heard of like how you tell a jumping worm from other kinds of earthworms. They have a clotellum that tends to be whitish, but there's variability in that. And it goes all the way around evenly um, as compared to like night crawlers where they have a very big collar or clotellum on their back. But if you look on their belly, it's not, it doesn't wrap all the way around. There's kind of a break in it. And you can see there are little, like little abs, you know, going down through that uh, on, on the underside of their body. So jumping where they, all three of these share that. Uh, feature. Where they differ most profoundly is in their size. And Tokyoensis is the smallest, and Amethyst agrestis and Metaphyra hilgendorfi. And they, that size difference can be pretty striking. And here I'll try to point with, let's see, got my, yeah, you can see my pointer there. So this is a picture I took in my garden. I'm fortunate or unfortunate enough to have all three species uh, in, in my gardens. And so this uh, picture I just took this past um, fall with my hand in there for scale. This is Metaphyra hilgendorfi, the biggest of the three. And I don't know if you can see it. I'll have to look in here. A cute little Memphis tokyoensis uh, that is just snuck into the picture up here. And this, so this is the total length of that thing as compared to Metaphyra hilgendorfi. So they, and once these earthworms get the collar, they they are mature and they can start laying eggs and they may grow a little bit beyond that point but they tend not to grow very much so if you see one and it's got the collar it's like a full-grown worm right you know so it's not it's like this one is not going to keep growing and get big like this it may just grow a little bit uh, after it gets the collar because after that point they're putting all their energy into pumping out eggs not not to grow so this is a picture that one of my students took that's just lining up all three species, Tokyoensis, Agrestis, Metaphyra, Hilgendorfi. Um, so um, biologists are pretty interested in the differences among these three species, but I'm not gonna make the distinction so much from this point on, because like I said, we're, we're not sure how much it matters. I suspect actually that, that it does, but it's gonna take us a while to figure that out. And at any rate, you probably, um, would continue to do the same sorts of management things to like prevent the movement, et cetera, of one species as the others. All right, so on to like the relevant aspects of their biology. These three jumping worms, unlike every other earthworm in New York state, are annuals. This is even different than Amenthus hupiensis, which is the other member of this family. So it's a pretty unusual life cycle for for earthworms generally on the planet, but here in New York, they are alone in being annuals, which would seem to be, you know, a disadvantage to them in the sense, like right now, if the abundance of worms out in the garden out here was pretty low. It took us a little while to find a few for that container, but I guarantee you if we'd have come, you know, like a month and a half ago, two months ago, they would have been all over the place. And the reason for that difference is that they're dying right now you know, their populations are going down and with the next, within the next couple of weeks, they'll all be gone in uh, from most, most all places up here. So all the adults will have died. Um, so like I said, that, you know, on the for surface of it seems like a disadvantage, but if you think about 
some of the more invasive weeds that you know, a lot of those are annuals too, and they're pretty invasive. I mean, that's they, they don't think it's a disadvantage, right? So the, the deal with um, annual animals in terms of invasiveness is that they can grow quickly at the beginning of their life, attain reproductive size, and then they know they're not getting out of that year well, I'm personifying these things, but they know that they're not getting out of that year alive, so they can put all of their energy into reproduction. They don't need to worry about maintaining their body, right, for, uh, for 10 years. Nightcrawlers can live over 10 years, and so they have to put a lot of energy into, like, making sure they don't get different kinds of diseases and parasites and growing their body and all that, but jumping worms, they get big, and then they just start cranking out eggs. Uh, and reproducing so they can put all their energy into that. So for half the year, these things are only represented by their cocoons, these egg cases, their eggs in these little cocoons. Um, and then they hatch in the spring. They're very small in the spring. So at the time when those little pink nose worms are coming out onto the sidewalk being really conspicuous, you won't find jumping worms very abundantly then. And so actually it's our most frequent kind of like user error is for people to call cooperative extension and other places thinking that they have jumping worms in the early spring when there are these eruptions of those soil dwelling worms and thinking that they have lots of jumping worms because those things can be pretty enthusiastic too. I'll talk about behaviors in a second, um, but those are not jumping worms. And in the spring, you will not find jumping worms abundantly. They won't, they're not big. Uh, yet really around here, it's not until, this uh, diagram was made by somebody in Wisconsin. It's not mine, uh, Kate Johnson. But anyway, so if we were going to do it here, you know, the, the cutoffs might be a little bit differently in here. Um, it's pretty close to this, actually, maybe just a little bit into July that we tend to find most of uh, jumping worms to have the collar, to have the cotellum. And that's what defines an adult worm from a juvenile worm. Yeah. How many of the eggs do they winter kill? Some of them? Pardon? Do, uh, do the eggs winter kill? No, they, in fact, it seems like win overwintering is part of their need in terms of hatching. Um, we, we don't know, uh, we don't know if they have a lower temperature tolerance, we don't know what it is. Um, and, and the hatching rates are extremely high in these overwintering and conditions that we have here in central New York. So if they have a lower tolerance, we're not, we're not there. <laughs> you know, it's part of, it would be somewhere up in Canada. Maybe maybe if we had a winter that it was extremely low in snow because snow is really insulative. So if we had very little snow and we had extremely cold temperatures for us, we might start to see that. But um, I guess the short answer to your question is we don't know where that that winter kill level is, but it's not a common thing here. Yeah. How many eggs produce in a yeah, good question. So they pretty continuously lay eggs from the moment that they get the cotillum. And they, so they will produce a cocoon with eggs on an average. Well, it depends because a lot of the data are from lab populations and it's hard to know what they're doing exactly in the field, but probably about once a week to or even more frequently than once a week, they're producing a cocoon, a cocoon with eggs in it. Yep. And they might have a, like a three month, two to three months, it would be the kind of longest, but they have multiple weeks during which they're reproductive. Yeah. So I may be getting ahead of the presentation, but each cocoon has multiple Yeah, so they're, uh, yeah, that's right. Not not a gazillion. So it, it, I think the average or the median anyway would be two. So a relatively small number of eggs, but most of them don't have one. Most have two, I think that's the, the most common situation. And there, there are some with three, and then I think from there, it gets really quite rare. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they, they actually form these balls when they produce the eggs. And um, maybe this is, I just mentioned how they do this because it's kind of interesting. That such a, the collar that they have actually is what, this is how it connects to reproduction, is that collar secretes 
the mucus that becomes the case. So they secrete the mucus. And then on the underside of jumping worms, you can see this if you look at them very closely. These ones, you can find it on there. On their, on their underside, on that collar, they have a little pink dot. And that little pink dot is where they push out the eggs. So they make the mucus and then they push out a couple eggs and then they, then they wiggle out of it. And, and then once they kind of like pull their body out, it dries and it pinches together on the ends. So these um, cocoons, are basically like uh, the candy with the twisted ends or whatever. There's, if you look at them, shoot. Uh, if you look at them closely, they're like pinched on the ends and they bulge in the middle and just couple eggs. And I'll talk more about cocoons in just a minute, but um, yeah, so then they overwinter and they die. That's their life cycle, different than others. Yeah, so here's a close picture of that um, female core that I was just mentioning there before. This, doesn't look that conspicuous when you're looking at them in life. Um, so the uh, just the word that you can't see completely there is parthenogenetic. So it, the, all three of these species to varying degrees are believed to be parthenogenetic, which means uh, that they don't need to mate in order to lay their, to have an egg that is viable to create a new offspring. Basically they produce clones of themselves. Um, and you might be wondering, well, how, how do we know that if we are not able because we don't know a ton about these things. Um, the reason that we know that pretty well for a fact for most of these worms is that most worms um, don't have the pores that can produce sperm in these species. So this is showing you kind of a zoom in of one of the species and these pores here and here are the pores that produce sperm. And so if they were going to mate and worms are hermaphroditic, I don't wanna get into too much of their biology, but you know, most species of worms do have sexual reproduction and mate, um, but they all, you know, the ones that mate have to produce sperm that they exchange with other individuals and then they mix those sperm with the eggs and that produces a viable egg. In most of these individuals, when you look at the worm, it has no male pores at all. There's not an opening there. And you look on the inside and they don't have the organs that would have produced that sperm. So they have a reduction of their reproductive organs in a way that doesn't, that doesn't allow them to sexually reproduce. So that can be an advantage and disadvantage for them, right? In terms of their invasiveness, in terms of their disadvantages, um, it makes them very genetically similar. Like within, say, a garden, those worms of, of whatever species might be so similar to one another genetically that my genetics colleagues that study this kind of thing can't tell the difference between them. Like in terms of the alleles of the, the, the different genes, they all come out looking you know, like the same thing. They're essentially clones of one another. I say essentially because it's kind of a messy system that they have for producing the eggs genetically. So it's not perfect. They're not perfect clones, but they're very, very similar. Uh, to each other within a population. On their advantage side, though, um, one individual can start a new propagate uh, a new population. So invasive biologists call this a the propagule size or whatever. Like what what does it take to start a new population? Is it like one male and one female individual, or you know, does it, would that do it and so forth? And so for these one individual, like one egg case in one batch of mulch that you get, that could start a population. And that's part of the, the issue, part of the, you right? Because it, it could just be a, a teeny weeny little cocoon that starts a population. Yes. Yeah. Well, not yet. So, but you, what you mentioned though is is hopeful in that if we find something that is that kills one, it should kill all of the members in that population, kind of like have an equal effectiveness on them. And so, you know, um, there are some people that are looking at pathogens in Japan where these species are in the wild that we might not have here, like a disease that they could get. And if we bring it over and they it, they, it may be really effective here because they're so genetically similar. Um, so it is a vulnerability in that regard that might be exploited by different kinds of control measures. But 
you know, into, like if I had to say, does it, do, do we see the weakness yet? We have not really seen the weakness yet. And in fact, very surprisingly, um, these worms early on, um, myself and others were very optimistic that they would not make it into the Adirondacks because a number of us had had sort of tested them against soils in the Adirondacks, which tend to be a little bit more acidic than we have around here and are different in some other ways. And we could not get them to grow in Adirondack soils. And we thought, yes, the Adirondacks are going to be protected uh, from jumping worms. And lo and behold, over the last, the, you know, the five or 10 years, the most recent five or 10 years, we're finding them more and more places in the Adirondacks. And in fact, I found them at one of the trailheads in the Adirondacks where I collected soil to test them against, you know, about 10 years ago. And I couldn't get them to grow in those soils, but they're there now is one of the species is there. And so we're not sure, but it seems like they're adapting. You know, like if, if you have a whole bunch of egg cases that are moved to a place, it may be that the genomes of the genes of the vast majority of those things might die in that situation. But if there's one lineage that has a little mutation that allows it to survive, that one egg can then, you know, make a population there. So they do seem to be adapting to different situations like that. Yes. Just a thought. Yeah. We've got wild worms here in the right now. Yeah. So I don't know what the source of the adaptation. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting thought. So um, that has, that signal has already come through very strongly in water bodies. In soils, it's we're just seeing the beginning of the kind of the tempering of the acid rain effect in soil. But it's, it's coming, which is a good thing for like everything else, very like for lots of things, right? That, that we're not having that negative impact on Adirondack soils, but it is going to make life easier for jumping worms, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you can make it sufficiently acidic that you will kill the worms. Yes. You can also make it sufficiently basic that you will kill the worms. But to do that in a way that doesn't kill everything else that you want that you want in your garden is the tricky part. I'll get the control here shortly. Yeah. And that's been part of what we've been thinking about. But they they have broader tolerances than we wish they had. Yeah. Than we were optimistic about in, initially. All right. Well, continuing with um, biology here. Um, so they're called jumping worms for a reason because they are very, they are energetic. And let's see if this video works. Oh, yay. Okay, it's going to open it up. And, oh, this is great. Okay. Yeah, so this is just, that's just out of the same lab that made that life cycle there at the University of Wisconsin. There they have a botanical garden that's heavily infested. So they've been key players in the research world of this stuff. Um, but this worm is demonstrating the two things about their, um, can you all at home, do you, are you seeing the video? No movement. Well, okay, but can you see it now? I see it, but there, there, okay. it's not, it's not moving. There's no, Still not. And now, did I just go to it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Because I think I had the specific screen shared. So let me share the video screen here. Is that it? No. This one. Yes. Did share. All right, so I hope at home you can see the video now because I just wanted to demonstrate the two behaviors that these things are famous for. Yes. Okay, great. So the two things that they do that all other earthworms in New York State are extremely, uh, do it un extremely uncommonly. So if it's a worm moving like this, you know that it's a jumping worm. One of them is they have a serpentine locomotion. They move like a snake, back, like winding back and forth like that. And other earthworms, they'll do a little bit of that, but they like their whole body in that kind of sine wave kind of thing that that's jumping worm behavior. The other thing is that when they're flailing around, sometimes they will like go nose to tail one way 
then nose to tail the other way, back and forth. And that's like kind of where they get the jumping worm name because if you put them in their hand and they start doing that, they can pop out of your hand. Again, uh, other earthworms that you're likely to encounter are not gonna do that. So those are the two things. A lot of people just look for like uh, motion, like, in th like excitement. And that can be a little tricky because you catch them on a cold day like today, they were not that, you know, excitable outside. Yeah, they're, yeah. Um, and, and that can depend on a lot of things. And other earthworms can be pretty jumpy too. And so that can be fool, that can fool you, but the sinusoidal locomotion, the serpentine locomotion and that head to tail, head to tail flail back and forth is pretty distinctive. All right, let me go back to the presentation. There we go. All right, so the, I've spoken about the cocoons briefly. I just wanted to talk just a little bit more about those because if you, if I, like you're thinking like I often do about like, how can we stop these things? There's a part of the year when there's just eggs out there. And if you could find something to kill the eggs, then you would just eliminate the population just like that, right? Because they're all just in that one life stage. If you can kill all the eggs, you've just freed yourself from dumping them in that place. And so that's kind of a vulnerability. Whereas like during the growing season, there are adults, there are juveniles, adults and, and eggs all mixed together and you gotta have something that kills all of those things. Um, so anyway, the, the cocoon is particularly important then in that regard. And this is just showing you up, up at the top the, the cocoons of the three different species. The cocoons, unfortunately for this species are very dark. Um, you'll see some pictures on the internet of them uh, being quite yellow. And sometimes they'll have a little bit of a golden, like if you look at them under a scope, they look a little bit kind of golden, but um, that, that's pretty uncommon. They look, they look pretty dark, which is unfortunate because it makes them really hard to find in the soil. Uh, my students and I regularly sift them out of soil to do experiments, trying to kill them in different ways. Um, and we, we have a hard time of it with like scopes and light and you know, tweezers and sifts of different sizes. So you know, to do this effectively, for example, in a load of mulch to make sure that they're not in there is, is really, it's basically not possible. It, it's really hard. Um, okay, so re regarding the biology of these things, as I talked about before, they're resistant to the cold. They definitely can overwinter pretty uh, regularly around here. And this is um, very reminiscent of a seed bank. There are cocoons or eggs that will not hatch the year after that they, they were laid, but will hatch the second year. And there are some that will not hatch the first or the second year, but the third year. And we know that this goes out at least to four years. And I suspect that we may, like it, it hasn't really started trailing off. There are a number of studies that we didn't really think to start doing this until about three years ago, but that looked at places keep all the new jumping worms from coming in and you just look at the uh, jumping worms that emerge from the eggs, get rid of all of those. Look, the next year, they come back, even though no new eggs were made the previous year, get rid of those. The next year, they come back. So even if you were 100% effective at getting all of the grown jumping worms out of your garden before they can lay new eggs, you are still gonna have to do that several years before you exhaust the egg base for the, the like seed bank. Yes. Yeah, so that's, yep. So if you don't mind me holding that point off because it's like one of the few optimistic things I have to talk about is that we, that we do know an upper temperature tolerance of these things that can be exploited by people to kill them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And a, a lot of the things that will eat other earthworms will eat these things. And they're right up near the surface. I've seen robins, thrushes eating them. Uh, chickens, you get various varying reports. Some people say my chickens don't like them, other, but I've fed them to chickens and they've eaten them. And a lot of people 
and say that their chickens like them. So I mean, it, um, kind of like birds will eat them. I know the trues eat them. Uh, pardon? Garter snakes will eat them. Uh, for a lot of these predators, we don't know whether they dislike them relative to other worms, but they're more available. So that's going to countervail that. Um, the, the issue, though, is that a predator needs to be able to like tamp, be able to effectively tamp down the population, it needs to take a significant fraction of the, the population away. And that has not been demonstrated for any of the predators of these things yet. One predator that I, I'll just mention, too, because it's kind of a cool thing, is that there is cool and weird confluence of things. But there is a an invasive flatworm that eats earthworms that will eat these things. And um, it will, they will attack jumping worms, but we, again, we don't have any evidence that they're able to tamp down populations. So some of you may be aware of these things. They're kind of longish and yellow, skinny. Um, they have a head, they're called hammerhead worms, bipallium adventitium is the scientific name of them. They're from Asia, they're from a range that overlaps with jumping worms in Asia. And they'll eat them. Um, but we, again, we don't have any evidence that they're able to control populations. So a, lot, a number of you have noticed the granular castings. It's sometimes referred to as uh, coffee ground type castings or cooked ground beef, uh, I've heard also. Um, this is very useful to us when we do garden surveys because usually we can come into a garden and if a, if a gardener is using mulch, we can just start scratching at the mulch. And if the mulch just whips right away from the, the underlying mineral soil, there are probably jumping worms there because they create these granular ball-like castings right up underneath of the mulch in between the mulch and the you know the more integral soil or what or whatever that are just kind of like ball bearings and they make the surface of the soil very loose. Um, so their digestive biology is different than the other earthworms in New York State, like night crawlers, other kinds of earthworms that you would have in your garden will not make this kind of Poop. That's that's what the castings are. It's just the the soil that's coming out the back end of, of the animals. Another thing about their digestive biology that's unfortunate is that they seem to be able to eat um, plant material that is harder to digest, uh, that is on the hard end of the spectrum of digestion as compared to other earthworms. So um, lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose, these are like the parts of a plant that if you were to eat leaves or grass or something, you wouldn't get really any energy out of it, right? And, and the animals that do get energy out of that, it's because of their microbiome. But these things seem to either they or their, um, their bacterial symbionts produce enzymes that can break down really recalcitrant carbohydrates that are in, um, that are in these different plant parts. So the, the bad part about this is that if you imagine like a, a, a pile of mulch in the middle of a Walmart parking lot, jumping worms can live in that because they, they're they happy navigating through that environment because they're used to living up in the litter layer and they can eat little bits of it because they can eat just like wood and they can get energy out of it. Whereas if you were to throw most other kinds of worms into that pile, they would not be able to survive. Um, that makes sense just because they they're reliant more on plant material that's already been worked on by fungi and bacteria and would be found down, down in the soil. All right, so that is it in terms of biology. Let me talk quickly about distribution here. A few years ago, we looked at a survey of what had been published on them in terms of locations and some of the citizen science apps like uh, IMAP Invasives or iNaturalist and where they had been recorded you know, with the a pretty believable record. And this is where we had seen them. You can see that they're kind of speckled all around New York State, but we've got some, uh, we've got a gap here in the Adirondacks just on the edges, right? Just a few years ago. Um, and then in New England, we've got some re uh, records here in near Burlington. That's because somebody at the University of Vermont studies these pretty intensively. Um, but it, uh, they're concentrated pretty heavily around the Champlain Valley, not as much uh, up in the mountains, and then not a, not very much in terms of records here in the mountains of New Hampshire and, and Maine. Um, one of the things that came out of this study was kind of a curiosity about Pennsylvania. It really is like, well, maybe they're not in Pennsylvania very much. But then we sent out a survey, maybe some of you received it, um, that just asked whether you 
you got jumping worms or something. Uh, this, that's represented in the yellow dots here. And one of the things that came out of that is that there are a lot of them in Pennsylvania. They just, Pennsylvania, you know, folks in Pennsylvania aren't participating as much in those citizen science apps because they're not promoted as much by the state agencies as they are in some other states. So anyway, there, there are a lot of them around Pennsylvania. I can attest to that one. Um, so, and, but in this, we didn't have any surveys that lit up in Adirondacks. Like I said, though, this is not updated to the last couple of years of surveys where we have found them a number of places in the Adirondacks. There's still a lot of places in the Adirondacks where, where we have not found them, don't get me wrong, but we're just finding them more and more places, especially around the Lake George area. It seems like they've really been brought in, you know, kind of um, maybe by downstate tourists into the Lake George area. And we think that they've been there for longer and they're really spreading out there. Over on the other side around Old Forge, we've found them a couple places, but not nearly as widely as on, on the other side. So right around here, in terms of distribution, I've already mentioned a little bit about how, how frequently we find them. Um, uh, Linda Atchamore, who's here, has been my partner in crime the last four years. We've gone around to uh, gardens, uh, mostly master gardeners' gardens, but some other garden clubs we've tapped into. This last year, we have uh, we looked at the garden clubs in Casanova and Hamilton as well. And so a lot of those gardeners like sort of self-selected in. So it's not a random selection of gardeners. A lot of people who think they might have them volunteer to be surveyed. For those things, but a lot of people that don't know that they have them um, also uh, invite us into their gardens. And so, for what it's worth, well, over the first two years, 2019 and 2020, we found uh, a less than 50%, close to 50%, but a little less than that of the gardens that we had visited had jumping worms. But in the last two years, that number has been closer to 65%, 70%. And so, this especially this past year, this was not a particularly good year for jumping worms. I mean, which it seems funny to say that, it's like, okay. <laughs> well, it, so we, in central New York, we had about six weeks that were quite dry. And it was at a time when if you had well-drained, a well-drained situation in terms of your soil, it might've been too dry for them and it might've killed them. Kind of during a time of the year when it was hard for them to bounce back up from. But, if your soils are moister or if you're in a place that's irrigated, that may not have been the case at all and it might have been really good for them. But there were a lot of places that had them the previous couple of years heavily that didn't have them as heavily this year. So anyway, I guess um, my point is that this, this number was not heartening, you know, that we, we had them uh, most places that we went this year. And just over the, four, over the last four years, we visited 86 gardens and uh, 55 of them with jumping worms. If you would like to have us visit your garden, see Linda. Because <laughs> we'll be doing it again next year for sure. Yeah. Um, and they are up into, can't just kind of like complete the distribution stuff. What about Canada? They're in Canada now. Um, but very recently, just in the last couple of years, they've been noted a number of places in Ontario, but pretty close to the border. These uh, dark dots here are places in Ontario where uh, they've been noted. And they were just in the last couple of months, there's a record out of New Brunswick that for a couple of these species as well. So um, it, where are they going to go eventually? The best guess that we have right now is just based on the length of growing season that they seem to need from the point where they hatch to where they can make eggs. As long as they can get big enough to lay some eggs before they die, then that population can probably survive there. And so there was a Canadian group that looked at where they had been found a few years ago, just modeled the length of the growing season that apparently was necessary. And they everywhere in here that's dark, they think they might be able to live and just in terms of the climate. So way well up into to Canada here and, and, and every place in the Adirondacks they think is possible. Um, we'll see how this is just considering climate. There are lots of other things that are important to worms, notably soil type. All right, so in terms of the negative effects, you know, I don't want to talk too long. Um, again, this is growing information that we have in terms of their negative effects. We believe that they probably increase rates of erosion in forests. 
and maybe in, in garden setting too, but of course those are more controlled usually in terms of um, erosion. So this is a place on the Colgate University campus it's where jumping worms are heavily infested around this tree. And after every rain, I just know this because I walk past this place regularly, after every rain, all the soil is getting dumped out here on the, the sidewalk. And it's all the castings. It's the loose granular stuff that gets washed away uh, whenever it rains. Having said that, this is yet to be documented um, scientifically. You know, so we're, we're actually, we're at Colgate, we're working on this the quantification of erosion. There's uh, the Ver Vermont people are too. It's like a arms race, well, jumping worm erosion arms race. We're hoping to beat them. Yes. The effect on leaf. On leaf mold. Yeah. I don't know. What? Oh, gotcha. Mold and yeah, in that sense. Yep. Yeah. So they just like, and in fact, I think I might. Do I talk about that next? Yeah. Um. So just like European worms, they eat they eat the leaf litter down. So if you're familiar with like the more to mull kind of system, where more is like more soils have a really thick leaf litter, um, like like in a lot of parts of the Adirondacks, is very thick, a lot of little rootlets growing up in there, a lot of fungi living in the, in the leaf litter. That gets eaten down to where it's just the most recent year, maybe a little bit of the year before, but a relatively thin leaf litter on top of what you would consider soil um, like the, that's dark and well propped up. So they, they do that. European earthworms do that too. In that in that regard, they're pretty similar. Their castings are different. That's the, the difference between the two, but they eat the litter, leaf litter down the same. And that's relevant to the next thing I was gonna mention, which is where we have this kind of growing uh, awareness that they decrease the biodiversity of forests by eating that leaf litter down. There are a lot of things that live in there. Like you might uh, be aware of things like salamanders and um, shrews. There are a lot of like vert, the small vertebrates that live in there, but there are a lot, a lot of invertebrates that live in that system. It's very biodiverse. And um, these data that I'm showing here that show a precipitous decline in biodiversity with increasing earthworm abundance. This, this is for uh, European earthworms, but we think that um, jumping worms probably cause something similar. So they're, they're probably a biodiversity issue in forests. So if you, Keep, um, if you're aware of jumping worms as an issue at all, you frequently hear cited concern about sugar maple forests and the decline of sugar maple relative to other trees in, in the Northeast with jumping worms. But I'll say that the recent evidence actually has been uh, complicated about this because this study, not to get too data geeky here, but this uh, set of bars here under the B, um, this is how uh, seedlings of sugar maple grew with and without jumping worms, the with jumping worms being the hashed one here um, uh, over time. And you can see that this these uh, sugar maple seedlings actually did better with jumping worms. And so what these investigators found is that when conditions were very moist, sugar maple seedlings actually did better when there were jumping worms around. But when conditions were very dry, they did worse. And so, and I think that this, it, there was another study that looked at another plant found something similar. So I think it's gonna be a, there's gonna be a, an interaction between jumping worm effects and moisture because of how those castings create like that upper layer of soil to be more well-drained. And they reduce the litter layer, that vegetable mold on the plant mold on top, which retains moisture. So when you have jumping worms, the soil becomes less resilient in terms of its ability to hold moisture. So when it's dry, it's, that's gonna have a stronger negative effect on things, I think, in forests. But when, it's, when conditions are really good moisture-wise, they may not show that negative effect. So it's something still worked out. Yeah, so I, um, the white pine, they didn't wanna make a conclusion about that because it's so close. With the white oak, I can't remember actually what the explanation uh, for that was, I mean, generally speaking, uh, the expectation was that seedlings would do less well when there are jumping worms there because they have very shallow root systems. And if they're only rooted in that casting, that loose casting layer, they're more likely to fall over, you know, or, or be damaged in the, by other effects, right? Like if you have erosion on a hillside, it's more likely to 
bring some of the seedlings with it. And so that was the expectation for all seedlings, really. So it's not so surprising that that species had a negative effect. I don't remember whether like that was negative regardless of moisture, you know, like, um, and it, it may have been. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for that because I don't remember from the paper whether there was a, a better conclusion for, for that species. Um, one other thing that negative possible negative uh, effect that they might have is that earthworms in the soil generally change the nature of nutrients that are moving through the soil and out the bottom of the soil into the particulate that goes into streams or goes into aquifers. And um, European worms actually can um, sometimes create a nitrogen sink, uh, basically conditions that allow nitrogen to stick in the soil better and not go as readily out the bottom of the soil and into nearby streams and things. But er, our, some early lab work with jumping worms showed that when you have jumping worms in microcosms, it causes more nitrogen to come out the bottom. And so that was that's a little troubling. And right now, um, where we've got a lot of, uh, of these lysimeters, things that sample the soil water in forest situations in central New York and, and elsewhere in North America, they're being deployed to try to understand whether this is a general thing. And if, if so, it, it might be troubling because it, it's going to end up with more nitrogen in streams, which end up in lakes, which cause eutrophication, right? Um, it's one of the common environmental problems in a semi-agricultural landscape like we have in central New York. All right, so um, I want to let me see if I can hide this. Uh, hide this again. Yeah, so in terms of, uh, you know, you all are probably particularly interested in the negative effect that these things might be having in gardens. And I'll say that we know very little uh, about this right now, but based on this, this is part of the same survey that revealed those yellow dots before, just to asking people, gardeners, what they think about the worms in their garden. They simultaneously um, indicated that they really like a lot of the kind of common garden worms like night crawlers and red worms and the other worms in their soil. But it, at the same time, they hate jumping worms. So that you see the like the uh, white bars are skewed up the left side, indicating that they like non jumping worm worms, um, but they're skewed up the dark side on the on the right, indicating that they hate uh, jumping worms. And part of that is probably due to just the how they, you know, their snake-like movement, the fact that they're right up close to the surface. So it's hard to not encounter them when you're weeding your garden. I'll say this, like you're in there weeding and the agitation of the weeding process actually makes them more likely to come out. And so you'll be weeding and then one will slither right across your hand. So there are some aesthetic reasons why people might dislike these things. But in terms of their negative effect on plants, I'll say that all we have now are anecdotes. Although we have this kind of like growing body of, uh, of anecdotes. And the people at the University of Wisconsin at Madison are currently compiling a list of um, plants that do particularly well and plants that do particularly badly with, uh, with jumping worms. Uh, not yet. They're, they're currently constructing it based on a, our survey, which asked some of those questions, but they also did a survey and it's not, not available just yet. Yep. And so out of, out of our survey, it was a, you know, a little over a third of people that we asked had some effect that they perceived as negative based on jumping worms in their, uh, in their garden. So not everybody finds them damaging to the plants that they're gardening. Um, this point, and this is your photo, Diane, from Diane Emmert's garden. Several years ago. Uh, I just want to point out a couple things about these things in terms of how jumping worms are different from European earthworms. Remember that annual life cycle, all European worms are perennials. So one thing that that means is that in terms of uh, nutrients, jumping worms are going to like suck up nutrients for the growing season, but then they all die more or less at the same time and release those nutrients into the soil. We don't really know how that affects things yet, but it's, it's clearly going to do something. Right. Uh, in terms of the casting, the way they make their castings, different from jumping worms to European worms, and they can attain really high densities 
um, at that kind of like peak in their populations toward the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. All right, so I'm gonna do this really quickly here. Um, control. The most important thing that people can do in terms of controlling them is to just um, slow the advance, you know, to keep them from moving from one garden to another. And I'll also just kind of like put on your radar to try to prevent them from moving from gardens out into natural environments. So if you have them in a garden, say that's maybe a foundation garden near your house, and you have a wood lot that's, you know, 100 yards away across a lawn, they may not move of their own accord across that. They don't like to move across lawns generally, that varies, but, um, and so they may not of their own accord invade that forest. But if you take your plant waste and you have a compost pile on the edge of that forest, as a lot of people do, yeah, um, then they will be there for sure. In fact, a lot of our study sites in central New York involve woodlots that have on their edge a little compost pile that people use to get rid of their garden waste. And one of the gardens that contributes there gets infected with them and then all of a sudden they're in the woods. So if there's anything you can do to kind of slow that spread from gardens to forests, the forests will appreciate it for reasons that I just mentioned. Um, in terms of control, just kind of like the first, the bad news is that scientifically we are not close right now to a control that will be specific to these jumping worm species. Um, right now, the, the things that are being investigated probably would control, would kill all earthworms um, in gardens. And so that's, you know, like if you, if you have worms that you really like in your gardens and you have a very small jumping worm problem, then you may not want to use any kind of control. But if you have very few of any other kind of worms and you have a lot of jumping worms and they're causing problems, then you may want to do these things. Um, we're also not close, it doesn't seem, to a, a control for cocoons, a chemical control. I'll get into what I mean by chemical controls here in a second. But we do have something promising in terms of cocoons. So most of the chemical uh, controls for earthworms use something called uh, a class of chemicals called saponins, which are natural plant products. And this actually has a really long history. So if you, um, in recent years, if you've heard of things like early bird being used to, to kill jumping worms, that's the mechanism by which they kill them. And I thought it was kind of like a new thing that people had recently discovered, but looking into this a bit more, it seems like it's a very long standing mechanism for killing earthworms. So this is showing pictures from an early 20th century English golf course. And people on golf courses have been worried about worms for a long time, not jumping worms so much, but earthworms generally. And so uh, people who tend golf courses in England have been spraying, applying uh, what they called Maura meal, which was a plant product that includes saponins on the greens, hosing it in to the green, and then raking up the earthworms that would come to the surface. And this is a wheelbarrow full of dead worms that came up from, from this plant based saponin that was applied to green. So this, there's a long history of this. They used saponins for a long time until World War II and we have all these nifty pesticides. Then they shifted to more intensive pesticides which will kill earthworms also. Um, and then as those things have been kind of tightened up on and have been made illegal, now that's fading away. And now golf course uh, managers have gone back to saponins and that's where early bird comes into play. Early bird was a fertilizer, but it included a tea seed meal extract in it that had saponins. And so people noticed that, well, this not only fertilizes my green, it also kills the worms there. And then in a nifty marketing technique, if you like look, think of the name, the people who produced it called it early bird, like early bird gets the worm. And it, worms don't appear anywhere on our label, but we're going to call it early bird, right? So then everybody started using it to kill worms, jumping worms, and instead of as a fertilizer, so they pulled it off the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. No, it's, or, it's organic. It's plant-based. And it, so these um, these saponin-based uh, plant um, products are, there's, there's nothing inorganic about it. In fact, uh, early bird is by Ocean Organics, which 
So they actually had to pull it off the market because everybody was using it for an off-label use and they were worried about liability. So you can't get early bird right now, but you can get uh, tea seed meal and a lot of other um, saponin based products. Yeah. Where's the neem oil? Neem oil? Yeah. Uh, not, I don't know. Is that a saponins in it or? Um, Yeah, I don't know. Okay. What about What's that? I don't know. I'm going to make a note of both of those. Yeah, so it's basically these are like natural detergents. Yep, so they're pretty pretty common. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's the that's the problem with saponins, is that what you're gonna have to do? Yeah. And so this is why it, when you look at like uh, cooperative extensions information sheet, any information sheet about um, jumping worms is not gonna mention uh, saponins. And that's because we don't know whether if you apply it in a way that is gonna, it has to contact the worms in order to kill them. It's not like you can, it can just like lightly be sprinkled in an area. They, they have to come into contact with it for it to affect the worms. And that means you're gonna apply it at a pretty heavy dose and really mix it into the soil. And it may be that that makes it into nearby water bodies. And there are lots of things that could be negatively affected by increased abundance of saponins in nature. And so right now, we don't know whether it can safely be done in an environmental context. So that's that's the why, you know, we're not, you, it's being experimented on in the lab, um, but but we don't know. Were you gonna cut me off here? I'm going really long here. Oh, you had a question? Right now, just that you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So saponins, like, um, they can be. I think they probably can be used in a sustainable way in a garden. Like there are wetting agents. So that's the mechanism of a wetting agent. Also, is saponins to kind of like break up soil aggregates and whatnot. And those things are used used to treat soils in a way that is on label. It's been tested, um, and so it probably is a dose related issue. You know, like to to get the saponins concentrate to apply enough that it's going to get rid of the the worms, um, it, it probably will have some negative effects, but those negative effects are not gonna be felt by everything. Cause there are a lot of things that are not affected by saponins because they're like natural soaps. They just like break down the surface of soft bodied animals. That's probably how they're like, they're creating micro breaks in the cuticle of earthworms probably, which are causing them to get infected and have problems that way. So things like slugs and other and salamanders and other things that are soft bodied probably are going to be negative affected, negatively affected by this, but not everything. Yes. Yep. They, no, they don't. So they're they're going to be found in their own casting layer and within just a few centimeters of that below that casting layer. So they are le legitimately close to the surface. We only find their egg cases up close to the surface. We only find worms. They will not make a long vertical burrow like a night crawler, for example. And their horizontal burrows do not go that deep. So they're they're close to the surface where things could come into contact with them. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, that second thing is something that we've noticed, but in terms of like their depth, so or do you mean you just have a really, really deep casting layer? No, no, they don't go, but it's about this deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yep. 
No, that's right. They, they'll be found as, as much as six or eight inches on a place that's had them for a while that where they have a pretty thick casting layer. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I was thinking more like three feet or more, which are some of these other earthworms can regularly go that deep. Yeah, so they're, they're closer to the surface than that. But we, we've also noticed this during the end of the year, they do tend to be found farther down, um, probably just trying to escape the cold before they you know, finally give up the ghost. Yeah, so I mentioned, you know, that we're studying these things. So um, we looked at a bunch of different concentrations of saponins, including you know, some of you have heard of like Dr. Bronner's organic soap. It's natural plant saponins that are the soap, you know, thing in Dr. Bronner's soaps. And so you can create a like a dilute solution of Dr. Bronner's soap and that will kill worms because of the, the saponins in there. We sort of um, looked at the dose of this and um, basically you had to create a pretty soapy solution. And the, I, really the thing that we learned of, of, about this is that you really have to make a pretty soapy solution come into direct contact with the worms. So like we've got, this person has got like a fire hose and they really coat the surface of the golf course with these uh, saponin containing things. Yep. Okay. So uh, I, I get the bottom line with these, the TC meal and all that stuff, which you can get um, is just, if you're gonna experiment this with this, you know, off label, just be really careful and to, and I would, I would um, guard against it. I mean, I would advise against it just because we don't really know what negative effects it's having on other things. But I will say that some people are doing it. So that's one of the things that we're looking at in the, in the lab. Um, Somebody mentioned pH. We've also done a lot of experiments with other kind of household remedies that people use for, for some things. And so like you can kill them with vinegar, um, but to like to kill them in, in your garden or in nature with vinegar, you have to apply vinegar at a rate that's basically gonna kill everything else. So uh, that's not really a solution. Uh, baking soda, you can increase the pH of your garden uh, that way, but again, and you can kill them, but again, you're really changing the pH of your soil and probably in a way that's not gonna be conduct conducive with um, your, your gardening. Um, some of you have heard of diatomaceous earth as a control for insects. And so there was some early optimism that this might help with jumping worms, but several studies, including ours, have shown no effect there. There's a line on here that the light gray line that is the control, the rate at which the worms died uh, without a treatment and the diatomaceous earth is right there. Um, the biochar line is a little bit optimistic. That is, we if, if there's quite a bit of biochar uh, mixed in with soil, worms do seem to not like that. We think it creates like micro abrasions in their gut that just make it more likely that they'll get infections or things. Um, and so there may be something with biochar, but again, you're, chain, you're conditioning your soil in a way that may or may not be good for your gardening. And um, one, of, one of the most optimistic biocontrol avenues is this um, bacterium, Balvaria bassiana, which you can buy as a biocontrol for uh, insects. It will kill earthworms. And this is a study out of the University of Vermont just within the last year. But these folks uh, noted that you can't if you just buy that and you apply it directly the way it is in the package, it didn't work. They had to secondarily culture it and coat millet seeds, little millet seeds with it. And then they could get the, basically the worms to eat it. And then it had a negative effect on worms. At the same time, it didn't like kill all the worms, but it did kill them more because you're looking at mortality of jumping worms here, killed them a lot more um, when those millet seeds were treated with this cultured, um, Valvaria fungus. So there's some promise here, but they're still working out the details of how can we make this into a, how can we weaponize this, right? And so one other thing I asked my colleagues recently when we had gotten together to do some work in the Adirondacks, you know, I'm talking to a gardening group this upcoming Sunday, what can I, what optimistic thing can I tell them in terms of control? And one thing that uh, somebody threw out that I hadn't really heard before. So it's some advice that clearly is not going to be 
uh, you know, there's no uh, collateral problems with is that there's a lot of evidence that jumping worms, when they create this casting layer, they're making the environment better for themselves. They use it like a little insulative blanket. They use it as a really nice environment to lay lots of eggs. And so if you can break up that casting layer, basically just turn it over to no longer make it, you know, to break up its integrity, you're making the, the world a little harder for jumping worms. So that's good. Um, and I'll just kind of end this control stuff with this optimistic bit about the cocoons and, and temperature. So a study out of the University of Wisconsin showed that you can, uh, you can kill uh, jumping worm cocoons if you maintain a temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit for three days. They've not fine tuned that yet in terms of like, well, if it's 110, to, can that just be one day or whatever? So we don't know the subtleties of this, but there is a high temperature limit that is not too awful high that will kill the cocoons. And so some people are using this by solarizing their gardens it, into these temperatures and killing the cocoons in their, in their garden. If it's a place like a raised bed that you can kind of isolate, solarize it, it when there's nothing, when it's fallow, um, you can kill the cocoons that way. This temperature also will kill any adults that are there too. So it's quite effective to get it hot. So we've got solarization. Somebody also mentioned the use of like set up a solarizing tent with plastic or whatever and kind of blast in that hot steam that is sometimes used by for steam weeders. This is a new thing to me, but it might ring a bell with some of you. There are these, um, basically uh, you've seen maybe uh, flame weeders, but there are apparently steam weeders that will kind of blast out hot steam or you can blast hot steam into this and maybe create extra high temperatures for a period of time that would, well, I'm just throwing out ideas here, but these things are all gonna be, at some point, they're gonna kill all your plants too, right? So you, it's gotta be a situation where you're just treating fallow areas. And although we've had lots of people try it, you know, applying flame to the surface of soil it really never works because they can go, soil is very insulative in that way and they can just go down a few centimeters and then I'm right back up. Yeah, we've had lots of people try it. All right, and that's, that's all I have. And I apologize that I went, went so long there, um, but I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. And I also have these kind of prompts if that stimulates any, anything you'd like to offer. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfect for them. They compost. So my question is, people have said, oh, it's a drying, but I'm also, if you have latent freezes, we're not killing your vegetables. That's definitely a thing too. It, this was documented in Vermont and forests. They, they um, went out lots of places, lots of times in the late winter to early spring and they found little hatchlings and then they would have a freeze and right after that they wouldn't find little hatchlings until they did find little hatchlings and if they had another frost, it would knock them down again. So that definitely happens. If it happens early on, there's time for the, like that, the hatching after the last frost to get mature, so it's not like killing them off. Any, but it, it definitely is going to have an effect on the total population size that year. Another question is, um, like a lot of people, just I use compost. I use compost like one month. Yeah. So if some sort of stuff in those hatches, I feel like I'm, I'm just feeding the worms. Um, <laughs> is it? I guess that's the question. What yeah. do you what really do in your garden? Uh, just trying to outpace them, but keep keep adding um, compost to your garden. Yeah, so I'll speak to compost. Yep. Okay. Yep. 
Yeah, so the, the question is about compost and uh, like strategies to use compost in, in your garden. Um, I'll, I'll talk to compost in two different ways. One is in terms of um, bringing new worms in, because a lot of people are interested to know like the risks of bringing in compost versus bringing in mulch and other things. And compost that's treated using a weed-free protocol to that temperature, to that you know heat, should be should be safe from dumping worms. So like that's bringing in, that's the first, yeah, I know. So that, that's the first thing I'll just mention about compost because I'll, people sometimes people are hesitant to bring in compost, but if it's compost that is heat treated to be weed free, it should be okay. Mulch is a different matter because mm -hmm. mulch almost always is risky. Um, but the second thing is you mentioned, mulch, or uh, sorry, compost will feed your worms. They all love it and it will uh, help their populations. And so I, I think uh, gardeners need to balance, you know, their uh, jumping worms are going to process whatever organic matter is in your garden if you use mulch or just other forms of organic substrates at the top. And so you have to, I guess, balance the need for nutrients in your garden against the problems that jumping worms are causing, you know, so I don't know that there's a, like a easy answer there. And I guess everybody's sensibilities might be different. Like it, it may cause more jumping worms, but at the same time, you're, you're kind of counteracting one of their negative effects by like keeping nutrients, keeping more new nutrients on the surface of the soil. So I don't know what advice to give in that regard. <laughs> Uh, uh, when your jump worms are superficial, maybe you use liquid fertilizers, maybe a lake uh, to the farm, so that it seeps down. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Can you repeat that? Yep. Quite um, she mentioned the, the use of liquid for fertilizers in the fall that might percolate down into the soil. So that's not really benefiting the jumping worms on on top much. And Linda, you use some some kind of liquid fertilizer, don't you? Thank you. Another question. 